This video is about the Lucius Trust and how all roads lead to Rome. So Chazanon, known as the Italian Black Nobility, the Orsini family of Rome were descendants of the Julio-Claudian family and one of the most influential lineages in medieval Europe. So I'm going to talk about how this family connects to the Rothschilds in particular and how these families kind of all interbreed. So we have many members of the bloodline that reside on the east coast of the U.S. and a lot of them still maintain the Orsini name. And this is Pepe Orsini of the Roman Maximus clan. So many researchers believe that this man is the Grey Pope and is the king of the Holy Roman Papal bloodlines. Allegedly above the Rothschilds and Rockefellers, but in line and of equal stature to Breakspear, Aldebrandini, and other Papal bloodlines, which I'll cover. Pepe is known to be a major depopulationist, like most global elites. If Pepe Orsini is the Great Pope, then it is believed he is working with the Black Pope in their Society of Jesus. That is better known as the Jesuit Order, which are the Vatican Assassins. And then you have the White Pope, which is the frontman of the organization. And you have the Great Pope, which lies somewhere in the middle. And Orsini, the family could be referred to as Orso and as well Maximus. Talk about a pretentious sounding name. They are a Zoroastrianist shadow hierarchy of the Jesuit order. So Zoroastrianism is not something I know much about, but I know it was practiced around the area of Iran and Mesopotamia. And their equivalent of a priest or minister is what they refer to as a magi, which is how we get the word magic. So moving forward, we can see, like I alluded to the Rothschild family interbreeding, we have Princess Olympia Aldobrandini over here, which the Rothschild family we can see is clear, clearly marrying into or was always a part of, I'm not entirely sure. But we can see some of these major bloodlines that are not spoken about so much like people always hear the name Morgan, Rockefeller, Rothschild, Carnegie, etc. But these are the names not mentioned so much such as Orsini, which I'm covering, Medici, the Borgia, which we've heard of, and Aldebrandini. And I'm going to mention the Breakspear family right here because he's Henry Breakspear is a resident in Macau, China. And so we can see that the papal bloodline is not just exclusive to Europe and that its tentacles do reach into Asia and India. And this region is important for what they describe as the coming agenda, but this article was written prior to 2020. And it mentions the Great Red Dragon in China, which represents Satan slash Saturn taking over the world. I've covered the symbol of Saturn in my Jesuit Order video. And I want to say that Saturn can be represented in multiple ways, which I will elaborate on. So... The Jesuit general is referred to as the Black Pope because he always dresses in black. And black is a symbol for Saturn, just like the number four and just like a cube and a square represents the same thing. So the Vatican is the religious center for the NWO. And every church in the U.S. or really abroad is directly or indirectly controlled by the Vatican, especially Roman Catholic churches. Now, all churches in the U.S. are incorporated, and therefore they would belong to the U.S. federal government. So that would make the separation of church and state a complete lie and fabrication. The Vatican controls the crown of England, the crown temple, and the court system in the U.S., and probably abroad as well. And this is why when you go to court, you'll see an agent that represents the crown and a judge wearing a black robe. I talked to you about the symbolism of black representing Saturn. Here it says the black robe uniform is a symbol representing a Jesuit priest, which is also appropriate. So nearly every church in the U.S. is infiltrated, as I said earlier. And that's why churches have the cross symbol on their walls and roofs. I'm going to talk about the symbol of the cross eventually in a little bit more detail than I'll explain here. But it's a symbol for the Knights Templar and it's been used by certain secret societies long before the existence of Christianity. 
So basically that means that the cross is not a Christian symbol. And the Vatican is in the middle of all corruption, which is why all roads tend to lead to Rome, as I said earlier. And that is the home of the Vatican. We can see the crosses on the Knights Templar. And there are many Knights Templars, such as the Knights Hospitallers, Knights of St. John in Jerusalem, Knights of Rhodes, and as well the Knights of Malta. So we see this Pope over here is one of the leaders of the Knights Templar with that cross symbol. And another organization that's prominent is the United Nations, which I'll be talking about a little bit. It has more authority than the U.S., as said here, and it provides trade, treaty, and negotiation services for its members. And it has a main hidden agenda, which I would actually say is quite open now, considering the time period we're in, and time is a construction that has been distorted by the Vatican as well. The main hidden agenda of the UN is to unite all nations under a fascist one world government controlled by the banking elites of Europe and Israel. Now fascism, communism, whatever, it doesn't matter. Left and right is just simply a smokescreen and an illusion. The name Israel or Israel represents the ancient gods Isis, Ra, and El. And the UN commits crimes against humanity through unlawful wars in the name of peacekeeping. So we see the City of London is the financial center for the NWO, and this city, the city-state operates legal and banking services. The banks in the City of London is headed by the Bank of England, which is controlled by the House of Rothschild. Funny how that goes full circle there. The Rothschilds, though, in the grand scheme of things, are still slaves probably to the Orsini family and to other papal bloodlines. Most money collected from the American taxpayers is sent to the banks in the city of London and then is distributed to other banks that are affiliated with the NWO. I don't have an article here, but the Bank of International Settlements is basically the bank of all banks. So we see this cross prominently again in churches, like I was saying earlier, the Union Jack, the American Red Cross, and as well the Maltese Cross. So we can see there are two operant crowns in England, and the obvious one is Queen Elizabeth II, and the Queen functions just mostly in a ceremonial capacity, and she just deflects attention away from the other crown, which is what issues her marching orders, and she issues orders through English Parliament. So the other crown, like I was talking about earlier, is the Bank of England, which is the House of Rothschild. Now I'm going to move forward gradually into talking about the Lucius Trust and its origin. So we have Alice Bailey as the center of that. So Alice and Bailey was a writer of more than 24 books on theosophical subjects and was one of the first writers to use the term New Age. Bailey was born as Alice Latrobe Bateman in Manchester, England, and she moved to the U.S. in 1907, where she spent most of her life as a writer and teacher. Her works, mostly written between 1919 and 1949, describe a wide-ranging system of esoteric thought covering such topics as how Spirituality relates to the solar system, meditation, healing, spiritual psychology, the, destin the destiny of nations, and prescriptions for society in general. Now, those two things definitely sound ominous. The other previous things don't. But we can see that her work is essentially a distortion, which I'll get to. She described the majority of her work as having been telepathically dictated to her by a master of wisdom initially referred to only as the Tibetan or by the initials DK, later identified as Dawal Kul. And her writings bore some similarity of those of Madame Blavatsky, Helena Blavatsky, and are among the teachings often referred to as the Ageless Wisdom. She is who started the Theosophical Society and again somebody who Alice Bailey was largely influenced by. So the Lucius Trust was founded in 1922 by Alice Bailey, 
who was a disciple of that theosophist, Helena Blavatsky, as I just briefly showed a picture of. The trust was originally known as Lucifer Trust, and it became a mother institution of the modern New Age movement. But the plan of love and light work out. Sounds a whole lot like QAnon's Trust the Plan. The Lucius Trust is dedicated to the establishment of a new and better way of life for everyone in the world based on the fulfillment of the divine plan for humanity. The educational activities promote recognition and promote the spiritual practices and values upon which a stable and interdependent world society may be based. Okay. So I'm going to read a little bit about it. The activities of the Lucius Trust promote the education of human minds toward recognition and trust of the spiritual principles and values upon which a stable and interdependent world society may be based. The activities of the Lucius Trust include the worldwide financial support of the Arcane School, the Lucius Publishing Company's World Goodwill Triangles, Lucius Trust Libraries, and Lucius Productions. Activities are offered to the public without charge in eight languages. So basically, this is an occult school, and I'm just trying to show you that an occult agenda is actually very much in the open, despite the fact that the word occult actually means hidden. So, moving forward, we see in order to place a closer focus on the work of the UN, and in particular, the Sustainable Development Goals. The World Goodwill at the UN provides up-to-date reports on UN meetings and processes. The new UN Sustainable Development Goals for Humanity set a transformative agenda for the 15-year period 2015 to 2030. So the Lucius Trust is on board with the Sustainable Development Goals and a genocidal agenda, quite frankly. So I'm going to talk about the esoteric meaning of Lucifer, and as well I'm going to talk about the origins of the word Jesus Christ. So, moving forward, just let me get my notes in order here. A lot has been spoken about Lucifer. A lot of fear has been conjured by the name that has been associated by the anthropomorphic Satan throughout Christian history. Outside the esoteric circles, very little or nothing is known about true meaning and purpose of the aspect, which is so relevant to the self-realization of being. Now, the name Lucifer is not a real name that appears in the Bible, but Latin version of the original word Hellel, which means the Shining One. The name Lucifer appears in the King James Version of the Bible, and a meaning, light bringer, is given to it. According to Madame Blavatsky, as I briefly spoke about, it is Pope Gregory I that made a connection between Lucifer and Satan when interpreting the only appearing mention of Lucifer in the Old Testament from a passive, uh, passage of Isaiah that says, How art thou fallen from heaven, Lucifer, son of the morning? Which was a passage criticizing an Assyrian king. Whether the Pope had some insight about the esoteric nature of Lucifer or not, we cannot say. However, the result of that was a polarization of the concept of God and his antithesis has since been perceived in Lucifer. So, and interestingly enough, in the book of Revelation in the New Testament, um, I believe this is the New King James Version, so I am going to say something that is slightly different than what's on the screen, but still the same idea. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. We know that the morning star is Venus, which has also been associated with Lucifer. Why would Jesus make a reference to himself as being the antithesis of God? Why would he be associated in any way with Lucifer? We can find the answer to this in the teachings of Samuel and Weir. I apologize for the but butchery, uh, for butchering the pronunciation of his name. So... The planet Venus is esoterically known as the planet of love, though as every planet has both positive and negative rays, polarity and duality being a recurrence theme in the occult, we can discover that the negative side of Venus is the opposite of love, which is lust. 
The light of lust is a false light that is a mechanical and ins and is enslaving, whereas the light of love is true light that shines like a morning star, illuminating illuminating the way for initiates that thread the path. We can only make of it our guide when the transition is made from lust to love, because only then can we see its light illuminating the path in front of us. And gradually, gradually illuminating and settling within our interior, the star is known as the Stella Marie, the star of the sea, the being, Christ. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, history of the Irish Druids briefly and how the word uh, Jesus Christ came to be. So when Christianity preached Jesus as God, it preached the most familiar name of its own deity to Druidism. And in the ancient British tongue, Jesus has never assumed its Greek, Latin, or Hebrew form, but remains the pure Druidic Yisu, uh, otherwise known as Isa, Iessa. So, Iessa Krios also had his crown. The Druid crown was not of thorns, but of roses. Regardless of the spelling and rendition, Isa, etc., the archetype remains the same. So, Ireland had its own indigenous solar region and church. Theirs was the original solar church and theocracy, probably transported from the pre Diluvian civilizations from which the Irish Gales had come. The evidence, for, uh, the evidence for this exists, but has been cunningly concealed for centuries by the Vatican, or ancient Rome, really. So that Irish Church of the Sun, the original Christianity, as stated here, I would say more like Christianity stole ideas from the Church of the Sun. It had its own pontiff entitled Krios or Christos its own Druidic customs, rites, and beliefs. These were of such immense antiquity and knowledge that all other cultures in the world awed them. So, the Irish Church had its own sun god and sun king. The Irish Druid priests are known to have personified the powers of the universe through the heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, and stars. This is where words like minister, deacon, sexton, and magistrate, etc. come from because they're all celestial words. It would appear probable that the religion of the Druids passed from Ireland to Britain and France. So, as we can see, or from my understanding, Celts and Gaels have a very interwoven history, but I'm not a historian and uh, I'm not really the person to ask, to be honest with you. But we see that the Irish King of the Sun was known as Iessa or Isa, as I was saying earlier, and the word Deus, meaning God, comes from it, and during their rites, the Druids would find a tree in the shape of a cross or would lop off the branches of a specifically chosen oak to make a cruciform. Upon this tree, the name Jesus was then in inscribed. So now we, we see how... Ah, yes, uh, we'll get to how that became Jesus. It was only after later mythmongers assimilated the custom and made a travesty of it that a physical man would appear hanging in pain from a tree. So the T-shape was taken from the letter Tau in the Greek alphabet, and we see the letter T served the name served the same meaning as the Greek Omega. So. Basically, what the, this is another symbol for the cross here, which we'll get to because Krios in and of itself, what it means is it's like saying circle or cross. And then we see that it basically means crisscross in and of itself. And this is why the title Christ is probably more prominent than Krios or Krios. Yeah, Krios. So, all in all, what I want to say is that the Lucius Trust is not a perversion of Christianity, common to contrary belief. There are many groups that predate Christianity, such as the Gnostics and as well these Irish Druids that I'm talking about. So, all in all, we have to think about the origins of things and we have to find our own power within ourselves because God is within every single one of us. We cannot externalize a savior. 
So we can see this is the world of fictions that we live in. A lot of people like to talk about how Canada is a corporation but don't really understand what that means. So we see Canada with its registered numbers on the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, right? And this is the corporate filing. We see that Canada is registered at the Canadian Embassy in Washington, D.C. So all in all, I want to say thanks for listening and all roads tend to lead to Rome. And as well, people like to throw around names like Rockefeller and Rothschild, but the reality of the situation is they're just puppets and all these archonic enemies of humankind do is they mimic, reverse, and pervert. They never create, unlike the Irish Druids and the Gnostics who did create. So thank you for watching.